Salo falava malo le sue fuo mawa malelangi e mama. Ni sambolo vinaka ke munisaka na wakanda mai viti. Hello and welcome to Talano Watupe. It's our last episode of the season and I have a very special guest with me in the studio today. My husband and co-founder of Poporazzi Productions, Isira Tanawai. Welcome to the show. Cheers. So I think, I guess, for this final episode... I think our audience will want to know um, a little bit about your story. So maybe we flip the script this week and we um, add you a few questions. Is that okay. cool? Yep, yep, sounds cool. good. Cool. So, uh, Tupi, tell us a bit about your background. Let's start off with um, my parents. So um, my mother is from Afenga in Samoa, and uh, my dad is, he was born and raised in Fiji, uh, but he is um, Samoan and um, his village is Falialili. And uh, they moved to New Zealand in the 60s. Um, my mum and dad raised my siblings and I in South Auckland. Mm. They made a very conscious decision to draw the best of both cultures from both the Samoan culture and um, New Zealand. Um, and they instilled in us the value of education. So they were both um, educators. Um, although they had to work very hard for their education. So my mother left school at 14 uh, to help put food on the table for her family. Yeah, my, my dad uh, grew up very poor in Fiji and uh, wasn't able to go to primary school for a, for a couple of years um, due to not being able to pay the school fees. So uh, when they moved to New Zealand, um, it was, you know, like many other um, children of the migration, it was uh, so that we could have a better chance at life. And so um, I was able to take for granted the fact that I could go to school, uh, that I could go to primary school, that I could go to high school, and that I could go to university. And that's something that not even my siblings could take for granted. Mm. Um, my um, So I'm the fourth of five children, and uh, my older siblings had to go straight to work to help mum and dad uh, when they were starting a new business. And so um, they, all of my um, family has graduated with their um, degrees, but most of them had to do it as adults, uh, whereas I had a very smooth path um, to education. So that's something that I'm really grateful for. How about cool. yourself? Do you want to tell us, uh, tell our viewers about your family background? Yeah, well, um, my parents, they come over to New Zealand uh, as teenagers. Uh, my mother came over when she was about 15. And my father came over uh, maybe in his early 20s, I guess. Um, and they, um, I guess, they were pioneers for their families and they moved to East Auckland and they um, were leaders in, in their um, little community. So they started um, the Samoan congregation, the Catholic congregation in, in Pamua. So, um, so growing up in that uh, surroundings, um, I had a strong sense of Samoan identity. Mm. Um, how about yourself? Uh, well, it's funny you should ask that uh, because uh, my identity, um, you know, is something that I struggled with for a very long time. And um, having parents that you know came from different islands, we spoke English at home, and. Um, my dad's sense of Fijian identity was very strong, um, mm. and so that was probably uh, the stronger identity when we were growing up. And uh, also, we had a lot of our uh, cousins come to live with us from Fiji. Um, and so, uh, my Samoan identity uh, developed a little bit later, um, but it's something that um, you know I've, um, you know, really tried to pursue um, as an adult. And um, 
yeah, it's something that, you know, I, you know, really cherish and I, you know, love learning about. Who are some of the um, teachers that you have in helping you learn your Samoan Ngana? Mm. So, I guess my, my first um, teachers uh, of Ngangana Samoa were my grandparents. So my, um, my dad's mum lived with us um, until she passed away um, just before I turned five. And she spoke four languages fluently, Samoan, Fijian, English and Hindi. Mm. And so we heard bits of those languages growing up, um, although we, we mainly spoke English at home. And then my um, mum's um, parents lived with us um, as well for a time and during that during the time that my grandparents were staying with us I learned a lot of the commands mm. um, so I learned uh, you know how to uh, do chores and, and things like that um, and um, I guess another you know step in my journey of learning Samoan is that um, I mean a lot of what I've learned has come from courses until I uh, married into your family and your mother has, um, as you know, been a really big help to me in learning the language. And, um, you know, I do think it's really important to have someone who has patience. So when uh, your mum talks to me and someone um, and I don't understand, rather than switching straight to English, she will uh, repeat it again in, in Samoan in a different way. And, um, I think one of the things that has been important for me on the journey is that um, because I have faced a lot of criticism for not being able to speak Samoan fluently, um, it's not that there was a lack of desire on my part ever to learn Samoan. Mm. It's um, that I felt I didn't have access to the resources mm -hmm. and I didn't have access to an immersive environment. Um, but nowadays there are a lot more um, uh, resources available, so I do your brother's course, uh, Taui Tua, um, as well as uh, the Nafanoa Tele uh, communications course, which both are online and um, I think are invaluable resources. True. So one thing I noticed when I um, started courting you and, and met your family is that your family is very business orientated. So where does that come from? Well, I think, um, you know, that has um, always been something that has been um, in our family is the entrepreneurial spirit. Um, so when um, my, um, my grandparents on my mum's side came, they, um, they worked really hard. They got a house in, in Greyland and um, they um, worked hard to set up all of their children with their first um, business. So mm. my um, grandfather sold... Um, the cinemas in Papatoi to my mum and dad. So um, as long as I can remember, mum and dad have always had businesses as well as um, my dad's salary as a teacher. So he was a, a teacher uh, for many years, including 20 years at De La Salle College. Um, and during that time, um, they also had a cinema, they had uh, a travel agent. And then they went on to establish a, a private training establishment, which was a second chance school, um, a second chance education school. Um, and thousands of uh, Māori and Pacifica students attended there to get their qualifications. So that entrepreneurial spirit has always been within my family. And in order to do that, you have to be willing to take risks. Um, and um, when mum and dad started their school, that did involve, you know, quite a big risk because my dad gave up his um, his salary, mm. um, his teaching salary. So, and that's where my brothers and sisters came in, who were, you know, adults at the time had just left school, and they came around to support that. And thank goodness they did because um, from that risk, you know, it paid off, and um, they were, you know, able to have a successful business for twenty five years, and. Um, thousands of people got a chance at a second chance, a second chance at having an education. Mm. So on that theme of education, so um, you got a lot of support from your siblings to help you put you th put you through school. Um, what about going into university? How did you um, do at university? For well, most of the time that I was at school, um, you know, like a lot of people, I wanted to be a doctor when I grew up, and then um, uh, just. I sort of had um, a really good think about that before I chose my courses at university and um, thought, you know what, 
actually, I don't think um, science and math is what um, you know. I was I was passing, but I had to work incredibly hard. So um, I always had a really natural affinity towards languages and English. And um, um, you know, after a conversation with my dad, he was like, you know, why don't you think about foreign affairs? And at the time, I had no idea what um, foreign affairs was. Um, but then, um, yeah, we we just had this chance conversation around the dinner table one night and it just kind of you know made sense to me that seeing as I was good at languages and um, and English that that's what I should pursue so I went to university with the specific intention of being a diplomat and um, I loved my time at university and um, then landed my dream job. Mm. So through your dream job at MFAP um, we had the privilege of um, doing a few postings overseas um, what can you say about a posting in Taiwan? I mean, I loved Taiwan. It was, uh, you know, such a special time for our family. Um, you know, it's such a great uh, place. Um, you know, population, 24 million people. And, you know, we have that connection with um, the indigenous peoples of Taiwan who are um, Austronesian people, so our older cousins. Um, and that brought special meaning to my work. But, um, yeah, just the chance to you know, travel overseas and represent New Zealand's economic and cultural interests abroad. Yeah, that was a real privilege. And, you know, I think it was a real time of growth for our family. Mm -hmm. An opportunity for our girls to learn Chinese. Yes. And for yourself to learn Chinese. Yep. How about yourself? Currently. I can order McDonald's. <laughs> but, um, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, it was, um, Taiwan to me is, will always be our home away from home. We made some great friends there. We um, we had so many great times there. Our second born was born in, in Taiwan, uh, mm. to a CV, Shi Wei. Um, our older daughter, Talisia, became very proficient in Chinese. So, and that's something that she's kept up to these days. So um, yeah, we always look back on Taiwan funny. We also got um, the chance to meet a lot of people and mm. bring people over to Taiwan as well. So. Yeah. Um, so one question I have for you. So, I mean, from like our very first date, you knew that I was heading towards foreign affairs. And, um, you know, that um, I guess the thing is that foreign affairs is more than just a job for me. It does mean that your family has to move around the world. And mm -hmm. how did you find that? Um, you know, just having that move and like, what did it mean for you, like personally? Hmm. Yeah, um, I guess for me, it was, uh, it was a bit of, um, bit of change. Um, leaving our support networks, especially leaving Auckland for the first time was a little hard for us. Uh, not so much for you, but for me. Um, you moving into your dream job and for me, tr trying to find my way in Wellington. Yeah, just being a travelling, uh, um, what do you call it? The trailing spouse. Trailing spouse. It's not a great name. Yeah, not a great name, but <laughs> yeah, the thing is, um, yeah, um, for me, my I always looked at my my job was to um, support you so that you could um, do the best in your job. Um, you were like, you know, it, it was a non-traditional um, situation where the the mother was the the, the um, person who made all the money and the father was the one who raised the kids, but, you know, I loved it. And, um, yeah, I, I guess I just um, embraced it and, and just uh, enjoyed it. So you got no complaints with me. <laughs> Do you know, one thing I, I thought was um, really interesting was that when our girls were young, and they would meet other families, they would say things like, hey, do you know so-and-so's family? The dad works. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and see, and, and uh, I remember sort of always go, "Why don't you work?" <laughs> Stuff like that. So, I guess um, times have changed, and mm. you know. But you know, one thing mm. I want to say about that is, you were working. You know, running the household, you know, is the you know was an an incredibly important contribution, um, you know, to what we were doing as a family, and because you you know, were holding the fort at home. That meant I could work late and attend functions and focus on my job. 
Thank you. It's nice to be appreciated. <laughs> okay, so are we going to go to a break now and then um, come back with um, more in, in the second segment? Welcome back to Talanoa Tupe. I'm here in the studio with Isira Tanawai. So um, we served um, eight years in Taiwan, and after that we had the opportunity to move to Fiji. Mm. How did that come about? A job came up at the Pacific Islands Forum, and um, I went there as um, the Development Cooperation Advisor, and um, yeah, it was an amazing opportunity because I got to spend time with uh, my family in Fiji and it was a chance for the girls who had up until then had a very um, Asian centric view of the world um, having spent most of their lives in Taiwan to be in the Pacific and um, to be a bit closer to home. So I think one of the things we've talked about in the show quite a bit is not taking our identity for granted and I learned that from my own struggle with my identity. And I think that was something that both of us were really aware of going into this whole journey with foreign affairs because we knew that we would be raising our girls away from home. Mm. So even things like, I mean, both of us with our names, you know, we thought when the girls were born, we thought about whether we make their lives easy um, and give them Balangi names. And then we came to the decision, no, no, they're not going to grow up in New Zealand. They might not grow up in the Pacific. So... We're going to, you know, give them their name so that they know who they are. And I'm really happy with the decision to name them Telesia and Tuasivi. After their... After their grandmothers. Mm. Um, and also it was a conscious decision that we made to bring them home every year, to invest, you know, no matter where in the world that we were, to bring them home every year so that they knew their grandparents, they knew their family, they knew where they were from. So, you know, I hope that, um, you know, gave them a solid foundation um, for their identity, but they, you know, are navigating, well, they have navigated three worlds instead of just the two mm. that we have. So they need to go on their own, you know, journey of self-discovery. And, um, but I hope that we've given them the best foundation possible. I think, um, you know, one of the things about being a parent is that you always want something different to, you know, what, well, not always want something different, but there are things that you um, um, have experienced that you think might be, you know, beneficial to do differently. Um, but I um, think it is very difficult to do anything different to the way that you were raised because you don't know how that's going to turn out. So, um, you know, I, I think uh, for a lot of us in Basifika families, because we defer to our elders, because we have that respect for our elders. Um, we're not given a lot of practice in disagreeing um, and uh, not given a lot of practice in expressing different views. Mm. Um, not when we're children anyway. Um, so I think that was a conscious decision that we made was that we wanted to um, allow our girls the opportunity to participate in adult conversations, to express their opinion and to disagree with us. And um, that's something we did deliberately so that they could survive and thrive in the Balangi world. And now we have to live with that. <laughs> <laughs> Hard. Yeah, I guess um, there's a good and a bad in trying to instill our culture and our, and our family values from our parents, but also trying to give them a bit of leeway to have their own personality and to be... Um, strong enough to be able to speak out in um, social settings and in um, in the boardroom as well. So, you know, that's the way we've always looked at, trying to make them strong enough to do that on travel both sides. Mm. So with the struggle of our girls, trying to get them, uh, give them a voice to be able to function in Western society, how did you find that with um, your creative stuff? You finding your voice and um, moving away from all your diplomatic work into your creative stuff. When I entered uh, a non-diverse, you know, working space, um, my 
response to that was to try and make myself the same as my surroundings. So when I entered the public sector, you know, as much as I really, you know, enjoyed my time there and I loved the work and I loved the aims and the ethos of public service, um, which is about, you know, being involved in the decision making for our country. Um, you know, I entered an environment that didn't reflect me and um, I responded to that by just trying to de-emphasize the parts of myself that were different. And, you know, I went on that journey for, you know, quite a long time before realizing actually it's the parts of me that are different that are um, my advantage. It's the parts of me that are different um, that are the best parts of me. Um, and so um, I guess the other, you know, side of that is that I am actually a very creative person, mm. um, but no one um, in my life up until, um, you know, up until a certain point knew that I'm someone who likes to sing and write music and write, um, um, and write about various things. Mm. Um, but I turned to creativity when I was facing challenges in my professional life and when I needed an outlet to express what I was feeling. And the thing is, you suppressed all of that stuff because you, your role as a main as a main breadwinner, you had to um, provide for us. You had to make mortgage payments and all that kind of stuff. So, in order to do that, you had to work, and you couldn't. You didn't have the time to do your creative stuff. So, um, just with the birth of misadventures, that would have come. That came through from your work experience. Do you want to tell us a bit about that? Yeah, um, I wrote Misadventures at a time when I uh, was disappointed that I'd missed out on um, several promotions. <laughs> and um, I guess it was part of, um, you know, it came from quite a painful, you know, period in my um, working life. And it was, um, sort of part of me trying to understand myself and I guess the conclusion that I came to was that leadership looks different to different people and certain traits that we value um, in the Pacific context like service and humility. Um, a Balangi panel is not necessarily going to recognize that as leadership and um, where I got to in my career was that I didn't need that external validation because I myself had confidence and I knew that I was a leader in my family and in my community. Um, and um, I wanted to share that experience and um, do so in such a way that was not about um, telling people, but showing people this is what um, you know leadership can look like as well. And um, yeah, I'm really glad that we, you know, backed ourselves and took the leap and made the series because when we played it to audiences in New Zealand, Australia and the Pacific, people loved it and mm. they they could relate to it because mm. um, it's a struggle that many of us have faced. For sure. That was the best part of um, making the series was having the audience um, Q&As afterwards, having people tell us that they felt like they'd been seen, they felt like they saw themselves in, our, um, in the misadventures, so that was real cool. Mm. Hey, uh, I didn't get the chance to introduce myself properly the other day. I'm John from Accounting. It's good to have you on the team. I... Alofa. Alofa? Yeah. No, it's Alofa. Similar to Aroha in Māori, same vowel sounds. Uh, no, I'm, I'm not Māori. <laughs> I know, but you live here, so I thought you might know Māori vowels. Oh, yeah, yeah, I think I've got it. Alofa. What is wrong with this guy? Fight be. Alofa, try to have some understanding, Wailua. You know, our names are very difficult for the Balangi. Awokipopoli. 
It's your name, Alofa. Your mother carried it before you and your grandmother before that. Do you think your grandparents left their homeland so your name could be butchered every day by some thoughtless moif? Be humble, Alofa. Don't make a fuss. Okay, yeah, yeah. I think I've got it. Alofa. John, repeat after me. Ah. Ah. Lo. Lo. Fa. Fa. Alofa. Alofa. Yeah, see, that wasn't so hard, was it? Yeah, I can get down with the brown. <laughs> it's good to know. Yeah, a good mate of mine from high school. He was from Samoa. Was it Tonga? Well, I've got a management meeting to get to. All right, uh, see you later, Talofa. It's Alofa. Oh, sorry. Alofa. 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 Yeah, one other thing, because um, that was personal growth for you to write that stuff, but for me, coming on as a producer, I, you know, really, um, that was quite daunting for me to try and make that work for you because um, I felt a lot of pressure to um, jump back in, in that workforce and try and um, bring everything together to produce that um, TV series for you, mm. or that web series for you, but, you know, I, I guess, um, I there was a bit of a sacrifice for us. I was away from you and the girls for a few months in New Zealand, trying to get everything together and trying to upskill and learn everything on the internet and how to put a production together. But um, one thing I found was that a lot of the skills that I need for production would we we already had those skills, mm. you know, from all of our diplomatic work from you know throwing parties and making connections and that kind of stuff. So, and I found that finding um, the right people to help us with our vision was probably the most important part. Finding people who knew what they were doing mm -hmm. and giving them the, um, the freedom to um, make your work come to fruition. So that was a real um, growth for me as well to jump back out there. Mm. Mm. Yeah, and um, I guess at, at the time it served a number of purposes because um, quite often when you're being posted overseas, you're not, um, you know, it's very difficult to find work in your field. Mm. And so, um, you know, you had been a stay-at-home stay dad for a number of years by that point and we had been thinking about ways to reinvigorate your career and... Um, one of the ideas that came up was film school, mm. right? And um, those, uh, our friends who had been involved in film sort of said, oh, well, you know, if you have an idea, then maybe you should just back yourself and learn on the job. So, um, yeah, I'm, like, that was another, you know, really great outcome of producing our own web series mm. was that you had the opportunity to um, get, some experience, um, not only on your CV, but to prove it to yourself, because I, I yeah. know that you were hesitant, but I knew you could do it, and you totally did. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I think we took a lot from uh, when you prepared Matariki in Taiwan, and you brought over artists, and you brought over musicians, and just talking with uh, those creatives, how did that influence us? That really sparked something in me uh, because I guess it was really eye-opening just to see how much artists believed in their own message and worked a whole lot of jobs. Um, you know, they have their hustle going on so that they can pour their resources into their passion and that I found that really inspiring and you know that's something that we've taken away um, from that time is mm. that um, if you have a message that you really believe in then you should back yourself to tell it. Oh. Welcome back to Talano with Tupe. I'm here in the studio with Asira Tanawai. So this is our final segment for um, 
Talano of Tupe, season one. We've had 12 guests, or 12 shows, that we've just uh, shot and viewed. Um, what are some of the highlights of um, our guests that we've had so far? Man, there's so many highlights. Um, I think, for me, there were some themes that came through really strongly. Mm. And um, the first one I've got to mention is faith. That um, came through really strongly. Almost all of our guests mentioned the role that faith had played in their lives. And for me, that was really special because we didn't set out to make a deliberately you know, Christian show, and yet it came up um, in, uh, in almost every interview. Mm. And um, I think for me, that was really special because um, you know, I've grown a lot in my faith journey over the years. And one of the things that um, has been made really clear to me is that um, you know, God puts people in your life for a reason and God makes things happen for a reason. And, um, you know, I just have felt, felt like with this whole show, um, it's come together so quickly and so smoothly because, um, you know, we've been blessed. And I felt that way with Misadventures as well. Um, mm. That, um, yeah, uh, that there was a reason for this happening. And I, I do feel like um, part of it was so that people could see the amazing things that God God can do in your life. So you're talking about God's intervention. So what happened when uh, God put Samson into our life? Uh, so Samson Samasoni, who is the general manager of Umbrella Multimedia, contacted us to see if um, he could show Misadventures of a Pacific mm. Professional on Oriana TV. Um, and we got to talking uh, because, um, you know, one of the things that we're really interested in um, is this platform for Pacific media. Mm. So, um, yeah, we had a conversation about this idea we had for the show and um, then we decided to do a co-production and the rest is history. It's pretty cool, eh? So, mm. yeah, the thing that amazes me is that we, we only had this conversation like two months ago. And we've been, we're, through God's blessings, we've been able to um, put together a pretty good show with some wonderful guests. Um, God's put a lot of really cool people in our lives, and it's just been um, a real privilege to share these stories with our audience and mm. to get that message out so that a younger version of themselves can see this. Yeah, so the other um, theme coming through, I felt, was the importance of family. Uh, and what really struck me was that for uh, you know, all of our guests, they have not only been successful in their own right, but they come from incredibly successful families. Mm. So all of their siblings have done well. And so that really brought home to me that uh, the environment that you create within the family mm. is extremely important. Mm. The ones who had the dad staying home with the kids were the most successful, eh? <laughs> no. You mean the stay-at-home dads? Yes, yeah. yeah. Oh, <laughs> well, actually, that brings me to another point. There, mm. We had a lot of uh, incredibly successful women on the show, and um, you know, as, as well as uh, successful men. Um, and the thing is that, you know, with Pacific people, it's you know our successes are the success of a collective. Mm. And for the people who came on the show. You know, a lot of them talked about the support that they had at home, you know, whether that was a parent, whether that was um, a spouse. Um, and, um, you know, quite often the spouse had, you know, given up something significant to support their partner, you know, just like you have. Um, you know, a lot of the successful women had stay-at-home dads mm -hmm. at home um, who were able to allow them... Um, I guess the mental freedom to be the best that they could be. Yeah, and I gave up a um, promising modelling career to support you <laughs> and I put on 50 kgs, but yeah, um, I guess in the end I came out a winner, so I'm pretty happy <laughs> with that. I'm glad you felt that way in the end. <laughs> <laughs> the thing that really shone through is just how multi-talented um, all of our, you know, guests were. Um, so for a lot of them, they achieved something in a particular field, but they were very talented at a whole lot of other things. So That's there right. were a number of things that they could have chosen. It's just mm. they succeeded in what they chose to focus on. Mm. So, um, yeah, I mean, 
that was a real um, eye opener. And I just, yeah, I feel just so grateful that we had um, the opportunity to um, to share these stories because, um, you know, growing up, I don't feel like um, I had many. I could see myself reflected on screen. Um, I remember growing up, there was a magazine called Achievers Magazine, and mm. that came out once a year. And I, you know, just devoured it every, you know, every year when it came out um, because I wanted to know the stories of people. Actually, they featured people who had um, who had gotten into MFAT. And I used to read their stories religiously mm. every year to kind of see, okay, what did they study? Um, what did they do? And, um, you know, I just, I really hope that people will, um, you know, younger people will benefit um, from watching, you know, these inspirational stories. Yeah, um, I guess some of the takeaways I, I took from these, um, I guess one thing that really um, hit me was Finger, um, what he went through through COVID, losing his father, and just, um, just to have the big guy break down, I felt really bad, but I also felt like that was therapeutic for him and it was also a really um, good message to, to share with the audience to see that, to show that um, even though they did it tough, they did mm. it the right way. Mm. They um, obeyed all of the rules of COVID because you know, we're in unprecedented times. We're going through stuff that we've never been through with this COVID lockdown and stuff. But for them to come through that and to in the end come out with a positive um, experience and celebrating his father's life. Um, that really, that was a real um, a high point for me in the series. Yeah. I, I really appreciated his willingness to share. And um, yeah, I just feel like, um, you know, we need guys to open up. Mm. and to to share what's you know what they're feeling it's so important for um yeah for 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 your mental health to be able mm. to to share really you know to to really share how you're feeling um any other takeaways from our guests oh um i mean i think one thing that i would really like to note is that we are only just scratching the surface here in terms of That's the right. stories that there are um of Basfika's success and you know just to come back to what I say at um, you know in every show which is that success um, looks different to different people and um, you know just the same as we, we've highlighted people who've um, achieved something in their field um, but you know equally as successful are the people who were um, you know supporting them um, to enable them to get to where they you know, got to. And, um, you know, I do think that um, there are a lot more stories out there and a lot more, you know, kinds of success that, you know, I would like to delve into in future mm. seasons. And we've only touched, we've only really um, approached our Wellington base as well. So there's a lot more of Pacifica excellence all throughout New Zealand that we'd love to get to in further seasons as well. Eh? I think it's a good time for us to thank all of the people that have helped us out with mm. this um, season. Um, big thanks to Umbrella, um, Umbrella Multimedia, Multimedia um, our co-producers um, who helped us bring Talano Tupe um, to Oriana TV, mm. um, Samson Simsoni and his crew. Um, also um, our people who help, helped out um, with our set, um, our sponsors who who gave us items for our beautiful set here. Um, yeah, we've got um, Langi, who uh, Roots of the Pacific, the um, store in Lower Hut, who uh, donated some items, some beautiful items for our shelves. And we've also got Masi, who gave us this beautiful tuinga, uh, Masi from Wainu Yamata. Um, and also to our family and friends who always supported us our um, supporters on Paparazzi and our supporters through Oriana TV, but mostly our two daughters who are our inspirations who, who helped us out on set every mm. day as well. So mm. that for me is a highlight to be able to 
create an opportunity for our daughters to um, get into this as well. Because mm -hmm. we always wanted to, I guess for us it was always a dream to work on um, productions and work on film sets and stuff like that. But for us to be able to create that opportunity for our daughters ourselves, who are who are um, forces to be reckoned with themselves, you know, that was a real highlight for me as well. Okay, so I am going to turn the tables on you and give you a quick fire around. Okay, so Tupe, what is your go-to karaoke song? Baby, I love your way, will to power. Really? Okay. Who was the most influ influential Pacifica person you saw growing up? Definitely um, my parents and um, grandparents. Can I answer this too? Michael Jones for me. Mm, yeah. Mm. So if you weren't in a, your current profession, what would you be doing now? Um, so when people used to ask me this, I always used to say filmmaker, um, but now I get to do both, so. Nothing else? Singer. <laughs> Anything else? <laughs> okay. I trained as a lawyer, but I never practiced, so lawyer. Mm, lawyer. Okay, if you could invite any three people in history to a family dinner, who would it be and why? See, I would really like to have three dinners. <laughs> it's your show, sure. <laughs> who are your three dinners? Okay, so three separate dinners. Okay, so uh, the first dinner I would have um, Jesus, Muhammad, mm. and... Uh, and uh, Buddha, because I think that would be like a fascinating conversation. It would. Yeah. Mm. Uh, and then second dinner, uh, the Obamas and Oprah. Yeah, fangirling, yep. Yep. And third dinner, I would have um, support Tama Cecilia Lofi the third, um, Olaf Nelson, and um, Olaf Nelson's daughter, her name escapes me right now. Mm. She w w was a real successful business person as well. Eh? She was uh, the first woman lawyer in New Zealand. Mm. Okay, um, and your last one, how do you want to be remembered? I want to be remembered as someone who um, tried her best to um, make things a little bit better in every situation that I was in. And um, I also want to be remembered as someone who made people feel heard. That's great. I just want to say congratulations to Pat on um, always getting stuff done, um, having Talanoa with Tupu be such a success, um, and just for always being a, a beacon of light for our people, and just so proud to do life with you, and just, um, yeah, just really proud of you. Thank you. Okay, so normally every week we um, we fade out to music uh, by um, our nephew Soul Brown and the Soul Sisters, but this week we've got a special treat for you guys. We're going to play um, some new music from Tupu herself and the Paparazzi Music, and the song is called Four For Me. And what's the song about? Um, it's about uh, falling in love with this guy who wanted to be friends. Skinny guy? <laughs> um, yeah, no, it's uh, the story of um, when we first met. Um, but I just want to say thank you so much because it's been a pleasure having you um, on the show and, you know, having your support and um, making this happen um, along with our co-production partner, Umbrella Multimedia. So, yeah. Thank you so much. Thanks for joining us on Talano of Tupi. See you next season. Baby
praise To the one that make me happy for the rest of my days To the one that always pray what's promising me Or who would give me all his love when I could just shine the Someone I could count on, someone I could trust Someone I think in himself, but I think in her Yo, I say I love you, baby, no, I wrote this for you Cause you're the one that I've been dreaming of since I was in school Cause back in the day, didn't even need a girl, yeah Back in the day before I came into your world But ever since we met, I knew you would fall for me And I always knew I'd be the one to have you, baby Let me take you back, back to the good old days. 